good this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, I want to look at two verses, verses 16 and 17. The title of my message is called Courageous Communion. Say that with me, Courageous Communion. Now you may say, that's kind of a strange title, Pastor. Courageous and Communion, do they go together? Well, hopefully at the end of the message you'll see where I'm going and hopefully it will reveal to you a deeper understanding of what communion is really all about. And I felt very strongly this week as I was praying to take us another step deeper in our understanding every first Sunday of the month as we celebrate communion. We also do that on first Wednesday. And so I believe the Lord has something for us. Look at verse 16 and 17 uh, with me. The Apostle Paul writing to the church, he says, the cup of blessing which we bless, now he asks a rhetorical question, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, being many, are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. Here, here's the big idea I want to leave with you today. Courageous communion is more than a spiritual ceremony of, break, of the breaking of bread and the drinking of the cup. Now, in just a little while, we're going to take a cup with a piece of bread or a, and, a, and a cup with some communion with grape juice in it. And these elements are symbols that we celebrate the body and the blood of the Lord. And they are important spiritual ceremony that Jesus encouraged us to do in remembrance of of me. But I believe the Apostle Paul here is saying to us something very significant and important and shows us a deeper level of understanding of communion, that it's more than just a ceremony we do ritualistically or some even religiously, and it's more than just taking of a piece of bread and more than drinking of a cup of juice that represents the body and the blood of the Lord, that there's a greater meaning there. And so I want you to understand that that word in verse 16 and 17, the word communion, in your text, in the word of God, that word communion is used two times there, is the Greek word koinonia, koinonia. It's a Greek word, koinonia, and that word koinonia, which is K-O-I-N-O-N-I-A, and I don't usually give you a lot of Greek and Hebrew words, but we know the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. New Testament agree. And we have to see that sometimes when we see a word in English, there's a Greek word behind it, and sometimes we need to understand the meaning of that. This word koinonia appears 20 times in the New Testament, and it means a shared, common, and deep, intimate spiritual bond. Think about that. A shared, common, and deep, intimate, spiritual bond. There are two words that you will often see in English words we get from the word koinonia, and that is fellowship and partnership. Say that with me. Fellowship and partnership. So what, when I say courageous communion, what I'm really speaking about is courageous fellowship and courageous partnership that we have through Jesus Christ, that we have, to, how many know it takes courage to align yourself with Christ these days? It takes courage to align yourself with the church of Jesus Christ. It, it, it takes courage today to come into deep and intimate and shared fellowship and partnership with Christ and the things of God. And I believe that that's what God wants us to understand, that courageous communion is courageous fellowship and courageous partnership. Now, I've got two simple points this morning. First of all, courageous communion is the bread of spiritual fellowship, say fellowship, with the body of Jesus Christ. You see, he says in rhetorical way, the Apostle Paul says, this bread that we break, is it not the communion or the fellowship with the body of Christ? You see, the symbol of bread that we're going to hold and receive today is more than just something that we remember that represents the body of Christ. It represents that we are to have a shared, common, and deep fellowship with the Lord and with one another. You see, it's more than just I 
took a piece of bread in church and I identify with Christ's death and I thank God and I remember he died for me. But it also means that we are to have a shared, common, deep fellowship with one another as well. Not just a casual I wave to you on Sunday morning, not just an occasional we, we, we touch base with each other or I'm part of that particular church or religion. It's that we have a shared, common, deep, intimate fellowship both with Christ and with his body which represents the church of Jesus Christ. You see, the bread of Jesus Christ makes us family. Oh, come on. I love that word. I've told you from day one, and I think it's something that we've shared for 30-something years. My goal was never to build a church, but to build a family. You see, because that's what Christ wants us to have. Through the, every time we hold that piece of bread, every time we take that piece of bread, every time we gather for communion, we're saying, I have fellowship with God through Jesus Christ, his death on the cross, his body that was broken, but I also have a shared, common, deep, intimate relationship with the family and the body of Christ. That's what fellowship and what the bread is all about. The word fellowship is more than just an association with God and with religion. It's more than a gathering of people. You know, back when I was growing up, when we had a potluck dinner or when we have our connection in the room over here or when we do something that we call fellowship. How many know that is part of fellowship? But how many know there is fellowship is much more than that? Fellowship is a shared, common, and deep, intimate commitment to Jesus Christ. It's a commitment to Christ that goes on a higher level, but it's also a deep, intimate, shared commitment and connection to one another and to the community we call the church of Jesus Christ. You see, God wants us to be a family. He wants us to be a community where we care for each other and we have the kind of relationship by which we have a shared bond and common, deep, intimate bond. And how many know that bond is Jesus Christ? It's not anything else that brings us together. But the bond, look out over even just this congregation this morning. How many know it's a miracle that all of us are in this room today at this moment? Think about that. We were all born in all different places. I wasn't even born in Michigan. I was born in New York. Many of you were not born. Some were not even born in this country that are in this room right now. And the journey and the path of your life, do you realize all that had to happen for us to be under one roof at this place at this moment? Why is that? Because of the miracle of the bond and the deep, intimate connection and fellowship that we have with Jesus Christ. You see, that's what it's all about. Ephesians 2.19 tells us we're not strangers. We're not foreigners. But we are fellow citizens. And how many know you could say fellowship citizens? We are fellowship citizens with the household of God. We're family today. And we need to know that. And we need to feel that. And we need to communicate that. And we need to share that one with another. We may be different in many ways, but we are family. And we are a community that has a bond with Jesus Christ. The early church, Acts chapter 2, verse 42 and 43. The Bible says they, the early church that was full of the Holy Spirit, continued steadfastly. They had a deep, intimate commitment to the apostles' doctrine and to fellowship. And in Acts chapter 2, that word fellowship is the word koinonia, just like it is communion in 1 Corinthians 10 that we read. It's that same Greek word. See, we see communion in 1 Corinthians 10, and in Acts 2 we see fellowship, but it's the same Greek word that means a shared bond and a shared fellowship and communion. One And notice this, with the breaking of bread... You see, there's that bread, there's that connection to the bread, and there's that understanding that, as Paul would say, is not the, the, the bread that we break, is it not the communion or the fellowship of the body of Christ? They shared that. And in prayers, or the word prayers there really means worship. And the Bible says, 
a fear or a healthy, holy reverence and awe came over every soul. And God did wonders and signs and miracles in their midst because they were committed to the Word of God, because they were committed to a common fellowship around the Word of God, because they were committed to a common fellowship around the worship of God. They saw the wonders of God. And I submit to you within God's people, get a revelation and understanding that we are to be a shared common bond and we are to have a deep intimate relationship with Jesus Christ and that we are to have that shared bond with each other and when we have that bond together and we rally around the common bond of Jesus through his word and through worship when we do that we will see wonders and signs and miracles in our midst see it's not an accident that miracles happen they don't happen when we're distant they don't happen when we separate. They don't happen when we're not connected and when we form a family and a community and we recognize that we need each other and we need that common bond of fellowship one with another. If you continue on in Acts 2 and verse 44 to 47, it says, And they believed and they were all together and they had all things in common. The word common there is koinos, which is the root word of koinonia. And so the word common, you see communion, you see fellowship, now you see the word common. All those words are the same Greek word in the New Testament speaking of a shared common bond of fellowship. They had things in common. They had koinonia with one another communion. They sold possessions. They distributed their goods one to another. You see, when we give and we help someone else and one another, how many know that's koinonia? That's fellowship. You see, that's communion. You see, we don't just have communion when we take the bread and we drink the a drink the cup and take the bread in church. When we bless someone in some other way in, in, with our financially or we help someone, how many know that's koinonia, that's communion. We just participated in communion with God even though we weren't in church and didn't have a little cup and a little bread in our hand. You see, they continued daily in one accord. You see, they were knit together in one accord. There was a common connection. It says in the temple, and notice this, Breaking bread from house to house. They not only broke bread in the house of God or in the temple, they also broke bread from house to house. They had a common connection and bond of fellowship. With singleness of heart, praising God, having favor with all people, and the Lord added daily to the church such as should, should be saved. Listen, you know how church growth happens? You know how God will build his church? When we come together in koinonia, in communion, and in fellowship, in a shared bond with one another. When we have a connection of unity, when we have a connection of community, when we have a connection of family, we will see God add to our life and add to his church as well. We want to see miracles? We do it through koinonia, through fellowship, to the word and to worship. We want to see growth in our life in the body of Christ. We do it through unity and family and community, one to another. That's point one, second point this morning. Not only is the courageous communion the bread of spiritual fellowship through the body of Christ, but secondly, courageous communion is the cup of spiritual partnership through the blood of Jesus Christ. Partnership. Not just fellowship, but communion is partnership through the blood of Jesus Christ. He says in verse 16 of 1 Corinthians 10, our text, the cup of blessing, is it not the communion, the koinonia, or partnership of the blood of Jesus Christ? Every time we take the cup today, and we hold that cup, and every time we share in the cup of the Lord, the grape juice, which represents the blood of Jesus Christ. It's more than just a spiritual cer uh, ceremony saying, Lord, thank you for dying on the cross and thank you for your blood, which has power to do that. But that also means that we have partnership with God and partnership with one another for the ministry and for the work of God in the earth. How many know God still believes in his church and wants his church to do the work of the ministry in the earth? You know, that's why God established his church in the first place to be his hands and feet and to be his partners in the work of God in the earth and we are called to do that through his blood 
that he shed for us. You see, partnership is more than an affiliation. Oh, I'm affiliated with that church. I'm affiliated with this religion. I mean, no, it's more than an affiliation. It's more than that. You see, partnership is more than doing religious nice things or charitable things. And those are all wonderful and good things. But how many know partnership is more than I'm affiliated and I, and I do some charitable things? You see, what true communion is, it's a partnership, a shared, common, deep, intimate participation. Participate. I mean, no, we're not called to be spectators. We're called to be participants. We're to share in the ministry. It's not just for the pastor or a few other people to do the work of the ministry or to reach the world or touch people with the gospel and to help and to serve and, and to do. It's, it's all of us are called to partnership. That is participation in the ministry of God. And we're to have a shared, common, deep, intimate cooperation with the Holy Spirit. Because how many know we can't do any ministry and we can't touch any life without partnering with the Holy Spirit? without the help and the power of the Holy Spirit. But when we will partner with God's Spirit, how many know we will, through the blood of Jesus that makes us family and community, when we partner with Christ, how many know not only can we participate, but we can touch lives and make a difference for the kingdom of God. You see, 1 Corinthians 3.9 says this, we are co-laborers. We're co-laborers. We're partners. We have a cooperative... You see, God said, I've got a bunch of partners there on 11 Mile. We're partners with Christ. We're not partners with an affiliation of a church or partners with a group. We're partners with Christ. And we're partners with the Holy Spirit that together with your talents and your abilities and our differences used in a way that you will touch people and reach people and you will contact people that I'll never meet and you'll be able to influence others. And when we all touch our sphere of influence with the power of the Holy Spirit in partnership, that's when we do the work of God in the earth. And we are co-laborers with him. Romans 15, 25 to 27 says this, Now I am on my way to Jerusalem, Paul writing to the church at Rome. I'm on my way to do what? I'm there to minister and to serve the Lord's people. For the believers in Macedonia and Achaia were pleased to make a contribution. That word contribution in Romans 15 is the same Greek word koinonia. See, it's not just communion in 1 Corinthians 10. It's not just fellowship in Acts 2. It's not just common, the word common in in Acts 2. It's also the word contribution. We read the fact that it says this churches in Macedonia gave a contribution to Paul's missionary journeys. And when they gave a contribution, it says, to the work of God, they came in partnership with him. And communion with him. You see, when we give to the work of missions and we give to the work of those that go to other places or those that serve, and when we give, I mentioned to you last week how we were able to help those six children from the police department in the community and how our our team goes and helps pass out food. And When we're doing that in the community, when our helping hands, when they sort clothes and when they give away things to families and the ministry, you see, we're partnering together with them. We get a share in that. Maybe you can't make it there, but we can give toward it. Maybe we can't give toward it, but we can help. We can serve. You see, whatever we do, we are partnering together. That word contribution you never knew was the word koinonia. Every time we give, we're partnering. We're coming in communion. You see, we think communion is just I took a piece of bread and I drank a cup. No, but when we give our offering and we give our tithes or we give to the work of missions or we give to anything that we do, we are partnering with God through Jesus Christ in communion. He says because not only do we want to share in spiritual blessings, we want to share in material blessings. I mean, God wants to bless us spiritually, but he also wants to bless us materially. And how does that happen? Through partnership. Real communion. Shared one with another. First, 2 Corinthians 8 and verses 1 to 5. The Macedonian churches at a time of severe trial and extreme poverty. In other words, the churches back in the early days of the book of Corinthians there were having problems and it was a bad economy. How many know problems in a bad economy doesn't stop us from partnership? 
Notice what he says. He says, despite problems and a bad economy, they abounded with generosity. And I testified and gave as much that they gave beyond their ability, entirely on their own. They did it joyfully. We didn't have to persuade them or coerce them. They gave joyfully out of partnership, out of a shared ministry, the word koinonia there. Shared ministry, giving and serving the Lord's people. We did it first of all to the Lord and then by the will of God to one another. So we have the word communion, fellowship, common, contribution, distribution, shared ministry. All of those terms in the New Testament are all the word koinonia, the same Greek root word meaning communion. It's courageous to have that kind of fellowship. It's courageous to have that kind of partnership where we share and give and serve. And when we do that, that takes courage, both before the Lord and through one another. I love 2 Corinthians 13, 14. People treat it sometimes as a benediction, and he does close the, the letter of Corinthians with this. Listen to these beautiful words. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God the Father, and notice this, and the communion or partnership, the koinonia of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. You see, anything we give, any way we serve, anything we do, we've got to do it with the partnership and cooperation of the Holy Spirit. How many know grace doesn't come to us and love doesn't come to us and love, grace and love doesn't go to others unless we partner together with the Holy Spirit? Let me make this statement as we begin to prepare to land this plane this morning. Biblical communion, true fellowship, true partnership, focuses on what we have in common, not on the differences that divide us. Please hear me. Courageous communion is a church that comes in true partnership and true fellowship with God and one another that does not focus on our differences that divide us, but focuses on what we have in common, koinonia, communion. How I many know we're living in a culture right now that, and sadly, even in the church, there are those who want to divide us by our differences. Listen to me, church. Listen to me online. Listen to me in the building. There is a culture, and there are even those in the church world that want to divide us instead of letting us have true communion and true fellowship and true partnership with each other. And if the enemy can use the culture and use even people in the church to divide us, how many know we'll never accomplish what God wants to be accomplished? We'll not see the miracles. We'll not see the growth. We'll not see the world reached. It's only going to happen through communion, through true partnership and fellowship. There's a culture out there that's doing everything it can. And there are even people inside the church world that want to divide us. They want to divide us religiously. They want to divide us politically. They want to divide us racially. They want to divide us sexually. They want to divide us financially, but I submit to you today that Christ and his salvation is what unites us spiritually. And we should not focus, listen, we should not focus on our differences that divide us, but we need to focus on what we have in common. And when we focus on what we have in common, God will take care of the differences and we can see miracles, we can see growth, and we can see the world impacted with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Listen, if we're part of the body of Christ, the bread of fellowship, then how many know that we have Christ's blood, the blessing of partnership, running through our veins. Let me submit to you. I look around the room. I see different faces. I see different ages. I see different cultures. I see different races. I see different people from different places and different stages of life. But you know what? The one thing we have in common is that we have Christ's blood flowing through us through true communion, fellowship and partnership with Jesus Christ. Listen, 
We don't have Protestant or Catholic blood running through our veins. Listen to me. We don't have Democrat or Republican blood running through our veins. Oh, come on. Listen to me. We don't have black or white blood running through our veins if we're part of the body of Christ. Listen to me. We don't have rich or poor blood running through our bones or through our veins today if we're part of the body of Christ. If we are part of the body of Christ, we have Christ's blood running through. That's where we have real communion. When we can say, I'm not going to focus on my differences. I may disagree with you. You may disagree with me. I even disagree with myself sometimes. (laughs) How many know even husbands and wives don't always agree? We can't even sometimes figure out which restaurant to go to. Come on. But we still have communion. Thank God for holy communion. Some of you caught that. Others who went right, that's all right. Some of you know me well enough to know what holy communion is with husbands and wives. Oh, come on, somebody. Hmm. Listen to what Jude 1, 3 says this. Beloved, I love that word. I mean, that's a great word of fellowship and partnership. Beloved, he calls one another. We should call each other beloved. I, I know people would freak out if we did that to one another. Beloved, beloved, what a beautiful word, though. Beloved, I gave all diligence to write unto you about the common salvation, the word koinos, koinonia. We have a common salvation. You see, we can disagree politically, racially, emotionally, financially. We can disagree about different ideas and things. But you know what? We can't disagree on the fact that Jesus Christ was virgin born, sinless life, died on Calvary's death. He gave his body and his blood for us and that we share in his resurrection and he's coming soon. That's the common salvation that binds us together and gives us true communion, true fellowship, and true partnership. A common salvation. And I exhort to you to earnestly contend for this faith. We're to fight. Listen, we're not to fight with each other about our differences. We're to fight for what we have in common with each other. And we're to fight for unity and community and family and fellowship and partnership because of the blood of Jesus and because of the body of Christ. I've got to close. Smile at me. Boing, right at 11 o'clock. We're going to do communion in just a moment. And we're going to do the spiritual ceremony communion. But please, when you take that cup and when you take that blood, recognize, recognize that that's about communion is true fellowship and true partnership. Here's the bottom line. Courageous communion is getting a spiritual hug from heaven and giving a spiritual hug from heaven. That's what this is. When we take these elements this morning, it's like Jesus giving us a hug from heaven today. And when we smile at someone, give to someone, greet one another, serve one another, pray for one another, love one another, when we do that, how many know we are giving them a hug from heaven through true communion? Not just because I took a, a wafer and a drink in church. That's symbols of communion but real communion is when we connect with God and we connect with one another in fellowship and in partnership let me tell you a story as we as we close this there was a woman young woman named Linda who was traveling she was traveling in the rough highway up in the mountains between Alberta Canada and the Yukon and she was headed to a historic place called Whitehorse Problem was that Linda was not an experienced uh, mountain warrior and traveler, and she had a little Honda Civic, which would have been treacherous up those mountainous roads to go to Whitehorse. But Linda was gutsy, and she was determined to go. She spent the night one evening, and she took a room at the summit of the mountains and was going to head the next morning early to go on this journey up to Whitehorse. She told the clerk at the desk to give her a 5 a.m. wake-up call, which the clerk at the desk was surprised. And Linda didn't understand why until she woke up the next morning at 5 a.m. and saw the fog was so thick that it covered the mountain she couldn't see in front of her, and she knew why the clerk was surprised. 
So Linda, not wanting to be, look embarrassed, so she decided to eat breakfast. The little diner next to the little hotel was so small that she had to sit at the table with two truckers. She sat at the table with the two truckers, and the one trucker turned to Linda and said, where are you heading? And Linda said, to Whitehorse. And he laughed and said, in that little Honda Civic? He said, you'll never make it up that mountain. Linda, being gutsy and determined to go, said, I'm going to give it my best shot. To which the trucker turned to her and said, well, then I guess we're just going to have to hug you. And Linda was caught off guard and said, there's no way you guys are touching me. And then the truckers chuckled and said, oh, no, not like that. My partner here is going to ride in front of you, and I'm going to ride behind you, and we'll get you through the mountain. That's what they call a hug, I guess. Anybody who's a trucker knows what that is. And so Linda, the entire way through the fog and up the mountain, watched the red lights on the truck in front of her and had the reassurance that there was a truck behind her, and they made it safely to Whitehorse and through the mountain. You know what? When we go through the fog of the journey of our life, how many know we need to be hugged? We need someone in front of us and we need someone behind us. Come on. We need the hug of fellowship, right? And we need the hug of partnership. When we have that, how many know we can make it safely through the fog? And listen, we're living in a world full of fog. Nothing's true, nothing's right, everything's wrong, everything, it's crazy, it's insane. But you know what? Instead of focusing on differences, let's focus on what we have in common. And let's hug each other up the highway. Let's hug each other up the mountain. And let's get safely to where God wants us to be. Can I ask you a simple question? How many could use a hug from heaven this morning? Come on. I don't know about you, but I'd like a hug from heaven today. I'd like God to just say, I love you today. You're part of my family. You're a special son. You're a special daughter of mine. I, you belong to me and I belong to you. You know, there's something about that. I wish my mom and dad were alive every once in a while just to give me a hug and say, I'm still your baby. You know what, 63 years old, I, oh, I shouldn't have said that, but I, I still am, I'm still their baby and I still need a hug every once in a while. Come on, how many need a hug from God? Stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. And say, Lord, I need a hug from heaven today. Lift your hand toward heaven today. And just prepare to receive these elements. And as we receive them, as you take them, know that that's God hugging us. That's Jesus saying, I died for you. I love you. I'm hugging you and you can make it. And you can do it. And you can be healed today. And you can be blessed today. And you can be delivered today. And you can be family today. And you don't have to be alone today. You don't have to be afraid today. You don't have to be alienated or isolated today. You can be part of the family and the community of God. Because Jesus died for us. And when you take those elements today, it's a hug from heaven. And then I want to challenge you. Spend a few moments afterwards in connection and hug somebody else. Not physically, necessarily. You don't have to go around calling everybody beloved and hug everybody at church. But you know what? You can go around and say, I'm glad you're here. We're glad you're here. And let me introduce myself. My name is so... Don't just wave at people or just walk by. How many know we need to begin to build a shared, common, intimate fellowship and partnership with one another? If there's an area of need whether it's the garden or whether it's forgotten harvest or whether it's in the nursery or with the kids or if it's to help out in, in other way. That, say, I'm going to get involved. I'm going to participate. I'm going to come in partnership. I'm going to give. I'm going to serve. I'm going to love. I'm going to help. You see, we need to build real communion, real fellowship, real partnership with God through Jesus Christ. Lord,